Hello and welcome back to the Rockwood Academy. I am your host David Flanagan, also known across the internet as Rockwood. Today we are taking a look at a new tool to help simplify deployment to Kubernetes. The tool is called Acorn and introducing that to us today and giving us more context and insight is Darren Shepard, the Chief Architect and Founder. Hey man, how's it going? Hello. Good, good. Excited to be here. Excited to show off Acorn. Awesome. Well, thank you for joining us today. I think I, I'm particularly excited for this one. I'm looking forward to seeing how we can kind of change the way that Kubernetes apps are deployed today. We are in a, a very interesting landscape. I don't know if that's the right way to phrase it. But I remember speaking to Brian Grant once at Google, and he said he has a spreadsheet and there's over a thousand tools to deploy to Kubernetes clusters. That's a oh lot my gosh. of tools, yeah, a, lot, yeah. a lot of opinions. So. Um, before we take a look at Acorn, do you want to give us a, a quick introduction into who you are and what you're up to? Yeah, so um, so yeah, so I'm Darren Shepard. I'm uh, the chief architect at Acorn Labs, Labs so we're a new startup uh, doing Acorn. Um, previously, I was at Rancher, um, so I've kind of been in the Kubernetes space for a while. Um, created K3S, that's probably the most popular thing um, that, I've, that I've done. Um, so yeah, that's kind of my background. Been doing K3S for a while, and and um, if you follow me on Twitter, I'm on Twitter at I Build the Cloud. Um, it, I'm I'm pretty well known for um, just complaining about everything, just <laughs> frustrated and complaining about everything. And so, so yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's that's not a bad thing though. Like when we get frustrated at software, we get to bring our opinions and hopefully make the entire community and ecosystem better uh, by solving some of those frustrations, right? And I, I'm hoping that's what yeah, Acorn yeah. is to some degree. That as you take a look at this landscape of Kubernetes and going, this can be better. Yeah, I mean that's like the basic idea is like is just try to you know it's like I complain a lot, but I also do write software and try to fix things. And so the idea with with Acorn is to try to you know make deploying apps on Kubernetes um, you know just a simpler experience. So. Well, yeah, I mean you've got that bit of a legacy behind you now with KCS, like deploying and running a Kubernetes cluster is cumbersome at best and painful and sleep deprived at worst. And that single line deploy <laughs> of KCS really made everyone's lives a lot simpler and easier. So, you know, uh, hopefully you're bringing that same kind of frustration solving approach driven development to Acorn and hopefully it's helping everybody as well. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, so like when I announced Acorn, the kind of the, the blog, uh, I, I wrote a blog and I kind of told a little story about with my son where I, um, he wanted a Minecraft server. Um, he wanted me to run a Minecraft server. So I went and I ran uh, K3S. So, you know, it's like I created K3S. I can go and run it. That's really simple. And then I started like creating the Minecraft server on there and, and I just got frustrated with it. I'm just like, this is just way too much effort. And I went back to Docker Compose. And I'm just like, there's, there's got to be a better, you know, a better way to run applications. Because like for just some simple little side thing, like running the Minecraft server, it's like, this is just way too much effort. Um, so I kind of look at it as like, you know, uh, K3S was my best attempt at making, uh, running the cluster really easy for just kind of like a random person or, or there's a lot of, you know, amazing production use cases for it. But um, so this is like, now I want to move up the stack and just focus on deployments. Like how do you actually make consuming and using Kubernetes easier. Awesome. Oh. I'm going to throw a, a correction before I get something really wrong. I think a thousand tools, and I think it's a hundred. I'm starting to doubt myself, but I can't remember. So I'm going to clarify that later. But just in case anyone's sitting there, okay. that's ridiculous. <laughs> well, all you have to do, yeah, just just look at the CNCF um, landscape, and like that convinces you of the complexity. It's like you know that thing just the icons just keep getting smaller and smaller on there. So yeah, yeah more and more things to learn all. The time. I'm, yeah. not, I'm not going to rant about that today. All right, let's talk <laughs> about, you know, kind of, I want to touch on the inspiration behind Acorn. Like, I'm assuming your, your first Kubernetes application deployment wasn't with Acorn, of course. So I'm curious about, oh, no, no, of course. Yeah. you know, what's your what's your journey there? Did you, if you always just use straight up YAML, have you played with other tools? How did we get to where we are well, today? Um, yeah, so, I mean, I've, so honestly, so the my biggest focus within like the Kubernetes world has actually been helping people deploy clusters. And so I haven't spent like a significant, like I haven't spent a significant time like myself having to 
write and manage deployments on top of Kubernetes because I've, you know, the last five or six years at, at Rancher was just all about running clusters so the infrastructure. And um, so I haven't, you know, my, my past is not so much running applications specifically because like, honestly, whenever I got into that space, I would just get frustrated. Um, but at Rancher, like we did our best to really try to standardize around Helm. We did a lot of Helm. So I know Helm like through and through every little trick with it, um, know the guts of that very, very well. Um, and so we kind of did our best to try to make, you know, like how can we manage deployments with Helm? And so that's kind of one of the, like just looking at the complexities of um, creating Helm charts. But the thing that was interesting when I looked at Helm was it was like, well, how could I do Helm better? And it's like, well, you know, you could definitely improve like the syntax or something, you know, go, the, the templating is kind of difficult. But fundamentally, the, the thing with Helm was that um, Kubernetes can do anything and therefore Helm can do anything because it's designed to just package anything. And so that kind of led to this problem of like, well, I can't really actually make Helm better because it has to do absolutely everything. So like when I started Acorn was like, well, what if I just focus on application, not like I want to deploy a CNI driver or, you know, like the storage system, the real low level stuff that needs like privileges and like, you know, low level, like what if I just focus on applications, can I make that better? And so like, as I looked at that, it's like, oh yeah, this becomes drastically easier if we just kind of look at the applications made. And so that's, you know, that's kind of where Acorn sits. It's like Helm does absolutely everything and you kind of get the, the pros and cons of that. But Acorn is, is focused more on just the, application deployments yeah yeah i mean this is no surprise to people that have watched my channel before but this is our first conversation my my not i don't want to say hatred of helm but i have a not a lot of pretty happy things to say about helm and it's not because it's a bad <laughs> tool it's because every option in the helm chart now becomes a point of configuration and we end up with this explosion of interpolation and templating and conditionals and a huge values yep. file, which now needs a schema which is now half baked with general comments and i'm just like we've went down a very dark path here and we're, we're kind of not doing best practice we're not even doing good practice we're just retrofitting something i'm also not a fan of go template language either i think you know me neither yeah industry, i mean <laughs> Yeah, go for it. Yeah, keep going. I mean, I've made the comment before. Like, I think the only reason why it's popular is because it's in the SDK. It's like it's, it's just part of GoLang itself. So people are like, oh, I'll just default to that. I don't have to have another library. But it is one of the, yeah, kind of oddest. Uh, <laughs> I don't know how to say it nice. I'm not a fan either. You know. Yeah, I mean, we don't need to go into start discussing templated languages, but a lot of other languages have kind of just adopted Jinja or some form of Jinja yeah. and that works relatively well, but Go just went a completely different route and uh, it goes against yeah. what I'm familiar with. What so I'm all these tools, it's like all these tools, like, because I get frustrated too. It's like, I get frustrated with Kubernetes because like Kubernetes fundamentally just this kind of like raw verbose thing you have to deal with or I get frustrated with Helm and, and it's like, you know, because people have said like, well, you know, why don't you commit to like core Kubernetes and make it better? And it's like, well, I can't necessarily make it better because like it is what it is. Like it is as powerful and as successful as it is because of the raw and verbose nature. Because it's like it's a platform that does everything for everyone. So like I don't think there's anything like fund like because when I'm saying like I'm trying to make running apps on Kubernetes easier, it's like I don't think there's anything fundamentally wrong with Kubernetes. It's just there's not a proper like application abstraction on top of Kubernetes that exists today. And like everyone who's done that has basically kind of failed. And like my kind of hypothesis there is that is people um, have focused too much on CRDs and Kubernetes APIs, um, that that kind of leads you down a dark path that's like kind of <laughs> not compatible with a lot of things. Cause I, I failed in the same way. There was another project I did a couple of years ago called Rio where I was trying to address kind of this application layer. Um, and that, you know, there were some interesting things we did there, but all in all, it was not what I wanted it to be. And kind of my takeaway from that was like, if I'm really focusing on application, um, you can't get too much into the weeds of Kubernetes. Like you need to abstract yourself. So like with Acorn, we took a stronger approach of like, let's provide a proper abstraction layer. Like we're not doing with Kubernetes YAML. Um, we have our own DSL. Um, you can largely, survive with just like if you're like an um just deploying apps you can largely just survive with like the acorn tool um but anyways yeah 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 
you're right. Kubernetes kind of gives us these like primitives of pods, replicas, deployment deployments, services, and ingress. Like pretty much 90% of what any application developer really needs to deploy your application. But we do have this whole, what that, I mean, that's probably less than 1% of the number of resource definitions that are actually out there for the Kubernetes environment. And we have seen yeah. other composite style resources. Like I'm pretty sure there was an application CRD spec from Segat at one point or was being developed, but I don't think I've ever seen a yeah. update. So. <laughs> but like, that's like that, like, so the problem is like when you get to this application layer is like, you really have to start applying some opinion. Like it's really hard to come up with like, let's create the specification that everyone agrees on and can do everything. Um, you know, like there's gotta be, so it's very difficult. Like I don't expect like the app sig to like, you know, kind of be able to do that kind of design by committee of the, of figuring out, you know, this layer, because it becomes so much nuance. Cause a lot of people ask like, well, you know, there's tons of solutions that try to simplify the application layer. Um, you know, why is Acorn different? And it's like, I can tell you a bunch of like technical differences in our approach or whatever, but fundamentally it's like, well, I, I think we have a unique approach and that's subjective and we'll see if people like it. So it's like, you know, hopefully people try Acorn and they like it. And if they don't like it, then it wasn't good. You know. <laughs> We actually have a, a comment in the chat from Bogdan who was about to ask if you know about Rio and whatever happened to it. So at least there's a couple of people watching that are familiar with the work there. So, yep. Oh yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, I don't, know if, I don't know if you realize. Like, so I wrote Rio. Like that was my that was so the the, the backstory is K3S came from Rio. So it was kind of like Rio was a failure, but as a side effect of that of that project came K3S. So we're like, well, <laughs> I guess that was a success in that like we got something out of it. But Rio, um, it was fundamentally. Um, I don't think that the timing was right for it because we started Rio as being a, a more abstracted thing, but users just consistently wanted the raw access to Kubernetes. They're like, no, I want to be able to have access to Kubernetes. And, um, and we, I mean, I didn't think that was the best. So it's like, we had basically kind of morphed it to be more Kubernetes like, which then basically kind of destroyed any of the things we were trying to do. Um, so, so now I think the timing is different in that, like, uh, one, the shiny cool factor of, of uh, Kubernetes is going down. It's not like the new hotness. Um, so there's a lot of people who are just like, you know, been there, done that. They're like, I've done deployments a million times and I would just like something easier. Um, the other thing is Kubernetes continues to, you know, get adopted. Like there's no, there's like no slowing it down right now. And there's just more and more users coming into the space who don't, you know, they're not like the early adopters who love all, you know, it's like, they just kind of want to get things done. They're looking for simpler approaches. So there's, there's a, so the kind of the, the timing is different now where we can actually, I think, produce a tool that's provides a more abstracted experience. That's, that's simpler. Okay. So one last question, and then we'll actually let you share your screen and we'll take a look at Acorn. But I'm curious about not that I need a uh, minute by minute account of the night you went, screw this, I'm going to write on your tool. But I'm assuming that you said you were frustrated. And there are tools out there that I think are quite decent. You know, that we've got Pulumi, which of course I work for, so I'm always going to mention them. And CDK, yeah. which is in growing adoption, which allows us to build these kind of abstractions. Are these things that you played with? And then there was like this point where you went, well, that's not what I need. I need something else. So what was yeah. That? Yeah, so I, I mean, there's a good point, like Pulomi, um, CDK, Terraform, those kind of tools in my mind, they all kind of operate at the infrastructure space. So they're really good for like managing clouds and, and things like that. I think when you get, because like what you see a lot of times is like, those kind of tools are basically setting up all the infrastructure, the cloud and all that, like the, all the cloud resources. And then it's kind of like, those will then basically set up a pipeline. And now your pipeline for your application deployments is following like a different uh, a slightly different uh, procedure using like GitOps and people, or Tilt or or whatever um, Dev Spaces. There's there's a couple different Dev tools I've fooled around with. Um, so I think you know I like I don't think like those those tools are are really in the same domain as like the application deployment and like the, like just the pure app layer. Um, I mean I could be wrong, but that's kind of my 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 opinion on it or whatever. Um, but the, when you get to the, like the just Kubernetes development tools, the problem that I see is that like, I mean, they're very, they're raw, they're very different. Like basically like, let's say like something like Tilt, 
it's kind of like what you need to do to use something like Tilt is you first kind of have to have a Kubernetes deployment. Like, so you already have to have an expert in Kubernetes who can kind of define how this application is going to be deployed. So then you kind of move that back into development and then you set up the Tilt file to say like, okay, how am I going to iterate on this, this, uh, this application in, in development? So it's kind of like, it, it starts from like the ops side or somebody who really knows Kubernetes and then moves back to the developers. Um, and so it's like, by the time you get to the developers, it's like, it's kind of an odd experience. Like it works for someone who just like, basically like I can do a Git clone and I just run this thing, but they don't really know what's going on. They don't really change anything. It's just like, you know, it's, it's just basically insert code here. Um, so there's like that approach, but, and I, I don't see those tools have been like super popular. They haven't really caught on. Like the, the biggest container oriented dev tool that I've seen is, is that's by far the most popular is Docker Compose. Um, and, but so you see still today, a lot of developers are using Docker Compose on their laptop. Um, but then once they go to production, they still do Kubernetes or maybe they're still in ECS. Um, but if they move to Kubernetes, it's like, then they switch to like Helm and, and customize and whatever. And then it like, there's a lot of disconnect and friction there. Okay. Yeah. I think maybe in my head then I, I had Acorn slightly in the, the wrong place. I wasn't thinking of it as a tool similar to DevSpace and Tilt and Docker Compose, but now that I'm thinking about it, it, it does kind of satisfy that local experience. Um, does it move into the cluster as well? Like, is Acorn a tool that can yeah. be used? Yeah. Yeah, so it's both. So the thing is, is like, so fundamentally what Acorn is, the technology is like at the heart of it, it's an application package. So it's like, we actually build and package up an application as an OCI artifact, like a Docker image. So you can push and pull the whole thing as a Docker image. So it's kind of like, it's it's like a two headed beast. It's like on one side, we have a package that's easy to create for like development can interact with it. If you can do Docker Compose, you can interact with Acorn. But then on the other side, it's a package that like the ops or DevOps team can take and very easily deploy. It's a very well-known unit. It's well-defined. It's secure by default. It has like, you know, it's like the, um, it's like something you can trust because it, well, you know, it's alpha software, so don't trust it very much. But like, but, but the idea is to, is to get there because it's like, I, I want to, you know, so it's like, it's kind of like as, as applications are coming from your app teams, because I see this within the enterprise perspective, like they have difficulty onboarding a lot of app teams. So you have like this one central like team that manages Kubernetes and they have to onboard all these app teams. And so it's like, if the applications are developed using Acorn, then they can just very easily give that to the op team and they'll know exactly how to run it. It integrates very well into all the Kubernetes stuff, GitOps, everything. Um, but it's like a very well-known unit. Whereas like a Helm chart is kind of like giving, like if you hand a Helm chart to like your, op, you know, just like deploying production, it's the equivalent of basically giving a shell script. It's just like, you know, it's, it's very difficult. <laughs> it's like, you don't really know what it's going to do. So then you have to put in a lot of, um, you know, guardrails around that, you know, auditing and, and, you know, make sure you, you the RBAC and, you know, every, all this stuff. So, <laughs> but yeah, hopefully as I demo it, like, I'll, like it'll become a little bit more clear what it is. Well, yeah, um, you, you said lots of really cool things there that I'm quite excited about. The fact that you're pushing things to, uh, as an OCI artifact to registry, I think is where we're moving. Um, I see all these GitHub tools doing this now. We're seeing this from Flux, we're seeing it from Argo. This, this seems to be like the new, the new standard. So I think what we do is we let you share your screen. You give us the, yep. the overview of how this all works and then we can get some more questions out. Okay, so let me share, share my screen. Minimize that so we don't get nested. I'm gonna do just one slide so you get a visual representation and then I'll go into just program. Yeah. I'm not gonna do like slide where. Well, I'm your not. slides are up, so fire away. Yeah, let me see, did that work from? Okay, yeah, whatever, you can just see it. So basically the whole idea of the Acorn um, is like we start with an Acorn file. So you notice like Acorn file kind of sounds like Docker file. It's even written in the same style. You'll see as I demo this, like we took tons of inspiration from Docker and Docker Compose in the user experience, because honestly, I think those are incredible tools. Um, from a, like, I haven't seen any other tool, like, I mean, just the fact that the way that people can pick up and learn Docker so quickly and use it and become productive, um, you know, it's like, there's something to be admired there. And so we kind of copied a lot of that. So the, the basic idea is you have an Acorn file, which is like your, the, the equivalent of like the Docker file today will build an image, whereas the Acorn file will build um, an application. 
And the Acorn file can reference Docker files. So you can also build the images as you're building the, the application. So basically we run that, we create the Acorn image, which is an OCI artifact. And so it does include all of the Docker images associated. So you get one image, like one digest, one thing to sign. Um, that's completely, you know, as you move it around environments, you, you can, you know, you know, it's the exact same thing. Um, it's, uh, it, it's not like a Helm chart where like the Helm chart is just the metadata, which then references images. And then those images can technically change as you move around and you have to worry about like mirroring, con mirroring content. If you want to do offline, like air gap setups and stuff like that. But anyway, so we, we push that image to an OCI registry. Um, so once it's up there in the registry, then you can run it from any cluster any Kubernetes cluster, we just need like the Acorn runtime, which is effectively just an operator or a controller, whatever you want to call it. Um, so it does require admin privileges to install that. Um, I'm fooling around with like a solution that doesn't require admin, but like right now it requires admin uh, to install the runtime on the on the Kubernetes cluster. But once you have that, then um, then you can you can run these apps. So like that's like the ten thousand foot view of kind of what Acorn is. Um, I can just go right into demoing it now if you want. Okay. Um, yeah, and please, like, stop me, ask questions or, or whatever. <laughs> um, yeah, of course. Because I, I have a tendency, like, I'll just keep going and talking <laughs> and do out a million things. So if you want to, um, so the way uh, to install this, the easiest way is just through Brew. Um, or you can go to the, the GitHub page and there's um, binaries you can download. So we have Windows, Win Windows, Mac, and uh, Linux um, and the, the architectures, whatever. So you just install with Brew. Um, I already have it installed, obviously. Um, once you have it, you do need a Kubernetes cluster. So if you're fooling around with this on your laptop, um, Docker desktop or Rancher desktop should work um, just out of the box. Uh, you know, if you have any weird issues, you know, go to our uh, GitHub issues discussions or Slack channel and we'll help you out. Uh, we're doing our best because like, you know, there's so many different styles of clusters. And so it's like if you do like Minikube or Kind, there's a couple more steps you need to do because we need an ingress controller. Um, but we're trying to document that all. But I just know if, like the simplest experience is Docker desktop or Rancher desktop right now. Um, Okay, but to install it, you're just going to run like Acorn install. And this is where I said you need the runtime. So this is going to install the runtime on the cluster. I already have it installed, so that just, you know, went super fast or whatever. But so now uh, now I have this, and I can start uh, fooling around with it. So if, let me just show you kind of a high level of the commands. Um, I'm not going to go through each one individually, but it's like you see things like log in, log out, log out push, pull, tag, um, run, build. So basically it follows a very similar, it's like, so if you're familiar with building Docker containers uh, and pushing and pulling those, Acorn's gonna feel very comfortable because you're basically doing like a very similar thing. We're building application images and running them. So let me show you this little, um, this sample that we have. So this, I'll, I'll, I'll go through, if we have enough time, I'll show you kind of like two different things like this first is like a, a good like this is actually the app from our getting started guide but it's going to show you kind of like a development flow of like packaging up like a flask app or something like that i have another example in here which is like gonna make more sense to someone who's more like devops oriented which is going to be running jenkins um like a, a you know a jenkins with the kubernetes cloud and configuration code like um that whole setup uh, and, and that one's like more complicated, but I'll, I'll get to that. So for this little um, application, so we have like just some dumb little flat gap in here. Uh, and then we have a Docker file to build this app. So again, very simple, just, you know, copying this over, running tip. Okay, so now let's look at our Acorn file. And um, there's quite a bit in here to begin with, and I'll kind of walk through so you can get an idea of like what we're seeing in here. Because this is kind of like... Um, uh, somewhat of like a tour de force of the syntax. It's just throwing in a lot of things at once. But the first thing you'll notice is the syntax. So the syntax is, um, it's kind of like a JSON. It's a superset of JSON, so it kind of follows JSON. Um, we're, we're really heavily inspired by Q, 
Um, I can go into quite a, like a, a long spiel about um, why exactly it's not Q, but like we very much like Q. We're huge fans of Q. I've done a lot of work with Q. And so the syntax here is um, kind of inspired greatly um, by Q, but it, it, is, it is not actually Q. Um, so, but the syntax, since it's like, it's kind of like JSON, like um, it should, I, I, we haven't really seen much people like struggle with like learning that. It's all documented if you go to our docs. But so what I have here in um, this Acorn files, I'll start off, we have um, args at the top. So args are, um, it's kind of like the equivalent of your Helm values. If you want to pass in parameters at build or deploy time, um, the, you can define args and then people can, can reference those. I'll show you the args, um, how they work after I build this. But so at this top level here, I've defined containers and I have basically three containers. I have this first one, which is the app, which this is the, the Postgres app. No, I'm sorry, the Flask app that talks to Postgres. Um, and, and so there's a couple things going on here. First is I'm doing build. I'm going to build this from the Docker container. Um, I'm setting some environment variables. You'll see some interesting syntax here, like I'm pulling in some secrets. I'll just explain that just a little bit. And this here's where I'm referencing that arg to get the, the welcome. And then you can see a little condition here of like if args, whatever. Um, this is uh, um, this this is so like when we're running this in development mode, it's going to be slightly different than if we build it for production. And I'll show you what I'll talk about what development mode is later. Um, you can have depends on this just starts. This is controls the update and starting order of things. Uh, in development, we want to copy live sync over some files. And this is how we basically publish the port. So these other ones here, this is a Reddit's cache and this is Postgres. I'm not going to go into detail on those, but let's get into actually building the application. Um, so if I want to build this, I can, I can tag it as something. Um, I don't really need to. Yeah, well, I'll tag it just as like demo right now. So we'll go and build this. So this is going, it's doing like, it's doing the Docker build that was included, that the Acorn file referenced. And then it's also building the final um, application, which is the, the one, the one image. So, um, so I should see now when I do this, oh, uh, I just, it was this one right here. I just built that demo image. Um, so now I can run this. So I can just say Acorn run uh, demo. And now if I just kind of watch the output here, oops, uh, Mac don't have watch, I guess. Um, so this is coming up and then hopefully, this is, well, oh, this is Docker. Okay. Can I pop in for a second? Sure. <laughs> uh, yeah. So the first thing is we're kind of missing the first line and the last line of your terminal. Could you like just oh, shoot. scroll your window That's a terrible. little bit so it's not as tall? Um, I don't know. I think the aspect ratio is a bit weird, and I've been trying to work around it, but I can't quite get it. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. Well, what I can do, let me not, let me do, what's the, there's like a different, uh, no, there's another, may, no, is that better? Is it, is it, or is it still chopped off? Yeah, the bottom, the first line and the last line seem to be chopped off. If you just like make it less tall, so just drag it up a little bit. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, Come on. Why can I select? Oh, wait. Okay. <laughs> there we go. That's it. Okay. Perfect. Thanks. Is that it? Oh, okay. Oh, that's terrible. So you couldn't see the commands I was typing. Well, we, we okay. got really lucky and we could see like 90%. It was just when you like cleared the screen, we missed <laughs> the first command. And then when it got filled the screen, we missed the last command. But it was okay. We, we followed along. We're, we're still with you. So. Okay. So, um, so you can see here, um, so I built the application and then I ran it. So now I'm running it and you'll see like we, we uh, in the application definition, let me go back to the Acorn file real quick. I defined publish HTTP. If you do HTTP under the hood, it's gonna use ingress, which then um, requires like DNS. And so we automatically do a bunch of tricks with DNS. So you get, um, uh, oh, wow. The default terminal is terrible on a Mac. I can't even click on the URL. <laughs> I don't use Macs. I, I use a, a I use Linux, but I had to switch to it for this for this thing. So I had some problem. Internal server error. Oh, okay. Wait. Here's the server. Why is it doing that? Let's see. Let's see why that's throbbing. Okay. Uh, 
Oh, oh, okay. Um, okay, we'll, we'll we'll fix that. So there's there's a little problem in the in the apple in the uh, application, but um, but anyways, so we'll I'll, I'll show you. Uh, we'll fix that, and so we can kind of go into the the um, development mode. Um, okay, so so the idea is so as I said, you can. Uh, uh, you know, we run, run the app and then we give you a URL and then you can get, get into it, um, get into the app. Um, so if I wanted to update this application, like if I made some, some change or whatever, um, so basically you would just go through the flow. Like, you know, if I wanted to, you know, put some, something in here, then you can go and, you know, build this again, I'll new tab. Um, so like this will go build your application again. Uh, and then I can just go and update. <laughs> the name is Throbbing Glade. Um, update, and you say image, sorry, demo two, and then uh, that will then update it. So the, that's kind of like the manual flow of like, you know, so you can build, push, uh, and whatever. Um, so this is all like going through the CLI. I wanted to point out under the hood, this is like 100% Kubernetes architecture. There's a Kubernetes API under there and all that stuff. So if you, you know, you want to get into like kubectl and GitOps and all this stuff or whatever, it's all completely compatible. The, the A core, like the CLI is just like a really nice experience on top of the API. Um, but it's it's all standard stuff under the hood. But so, um, so what I wanted to show is, so I just did like a manual of like build it and then, then update it. What you can do is if you're running this like in a development mode, uh, let me just delete the app. Um, let me just delete everything. Okay. So what we can do is we can run this in a development mode, and this is going to be much closer to like a Docker compose up. So you can do dash dash dev. The short form of that is I, which is kind of a little weird, but, um, and I'm going to actually, I'm going to call it um, a demo. So we have a nice little name or whatever. So now this is going to run this in a in a in a uh, development mode, and so what you can do is like this will build it and bring up the application, and then it will um, live you know tail uh, everything that's going on. Um, let's wait for the the in ingress control or nginx ingress controller is super slow to provision, like um, so it's that's why it says pending. It's waiting on the ingress controller to assign to assign uh, something. Um, there we go. So now it's up. Okay. Let's copy that. Go back here. Oh, I don't know. I don't know what the deal is. Scram authentication requires version 10 or above. Am I running? Let me just see if I'm running them. Um, I guess that would be in your requirements about tech. Yeah, I don't know. So, uh, bu, 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 bu. why is it even doing authentication? I think it's okay. Well, let's let's talk. To, like maybe maybe we look at this. I don't know. This is one of those things. You know, it's like well, it was working yesterday. Um, so uh, let me talk about like the authentication and stuff. <laughs> the authentication is what's what's failing. So you can see here um, where we started up Postgres and we're using. Oh, let me make sure. Okay, I'll, I'll get back get back to that one in a second. I might be using an old data volume. Um, but so uh, so you can see here the secrets. So we've defined this secret here called Quick Start PG Pass or whatever. Um, and it's of type token. So what we do with secrets is like we want to, by default, um, we want apps to kind of work uh, out of the box and securely. So we have a couple of built-in secret types that will just generate a value for you. So this one, it just generates a token and there's parameters. You can control what characters and how long, um, but it just generates a random, a random token. Um, so, so what this is doing, so this secret, it generates this token uh, and then we can pass that secret uh, the token value to the password here. Uh, and then we can also pass the same thing here to uh, the, the password up here. Um, 
so that works for like development it'll automatically like generate like generate the secret at in production you can then bind in secrets so like as part of like the run command you can do things here where you bind in secrets so if you have an existing secret like you know it's you can create the secret if you want using the r cli but under the hood they're, they're still just kubernetes secrets so it's like you know, if you're doing sealed secrets or external secrets or, you know, whatever, whatever crazy way you want to manage secrets, you can manage those independently and then just bind them into the application and it'll use them. Um, okay, so so let me show, let's see if we can, I wonder if we can figure out why this. It says Scram authentication requires libpg version 10 or above. So I wonder if like it's a new version of Postgres. Should we try? You know anything about a uh, about uh, a very good Googler though? Let me check. Let me see. I wonder. I wonder. Let me try like not the Postgres. No, let's see. Is your Kubernetes cluster on? Is that local? Is it Docker for Mac? Yeah, yeah, it's just a Docker for Mac. Yeah, okay. So apparently it's an M1 problem. <laughs> it's an M1 problem? Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. So apparently okay. if, if you're happy to rebuild your images, you have to export docker underscore default underscore platform equals one up slash emg64 and then do a rebuild of your images and that will remove the error. Huh. So I'm assuming your but, Python it, app has been But built. I can't. Yeah, but I can't. Yeah, so that won't work. Well, okay, well that that's fine. I mean, that, whatever. So the app is failing. That's an arm arm issue, whatever. But that does point up. Um, we can talk about multi arc. <laughs> <laughs> we basically we we can like if you want to build like if I wanted to build this. I mean, I can I can build it for AMD sixty four. But the problem is, um, I won't. Uh, uh, it doesn't really help because I can't run it. <laughs> but um, right. I don't think I can run an AMD sixty four on. I don't think that works in Docker or whatever. But um, but anyways, but yeah, so if like I actually wanted to build, am I still in this app? Uh, so if I wanted to build this application and I wanted to support uh, both um, Linux AMD 64 and Linux ARM 64, and then let's just tag this as, we'll actually show like pushing it. I build the cloud, blah, 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 demo test. So this will actually go and build both architectures and then combine it into one image. So, I mean, we're, this is all standard OCI stuff. So we are using manifest lists and all that under the hood. So we just basically are pulling in the different, the requirements from, from different, uh, uh, I mean, we're sorry, not the requirements. I just read that we're pulling in the images from different architectures and then just linking them all together. So I think that just did the AMD one and now, yeah, it's probably doing that or yeah, now it's doing the arm one maybe. But so if I actually want to push this, so like I just built this image as, so now I can actually push it. And this first one that will fail because I don't have, oh, sorry, there's one, one tiny little thing that I forgot. You have to put the full registry in there, like docker.io. We don't have a default namespace. Like that's been like a big problem with uh, Docker in general is the default namespace always goes to docker.io. Um, so, so we just decided we're just not going to have a default namespace. <laughs> so that's why that, that push failed, but this will fail also because I haven't logged in. It's going to, it'll end up, oh wait, no, I guess I have. <laughs> oh, I already used this. That was, that was nice. <laughs> oh yeah. Cause I already had this set up. Um, okay. So, uh, so that's, that's kind of the basic flow. I mean, are you kind of getting the, the, the over kind of the overview of kind of how uh, Acorn works and... Yeah, I think so. I'd like to take a few steps back and slow down and just kind of cover everything. Although I'm slightly worried that you've frozen these other. Oh yeah, yeah let, me, let me just cancel that because it's trying to push a bunch ah. of content. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right, so let's take a few steps back. Let's pop open the Acorn file and I've got a couple of questions from in there and then we'll take a look at the dev loop. And if anyone watching this live has any questions, feel free to drop them into the comments we'll get around to them pretty yeah. shortly. All right, so the first question is, you mentioned this earlier. It looks like Q, you like Q, but it's not Q. I also like Q, 
but I'm curious. Why have you got a? Why is it not just Q? What were the? What was the thing in there? So the scope of Q, like Q, um, I mean, it's an amazing language, and the scope of Q, like uh, basically, what it comes down to is Q. The whole fundamental thing about it is like unification. Um, and like unification disjunctions, um, it works. So it's combining the idea of like schema and data into this one thing. And it's like really beautifully well done. Um, I very much like it. So kind of the problem with Q is that uh, all of the unique and cool features of it, uh, we don't actually need. We really just need a language that's kind of much closer to, to JSON it. Um, but we like the style of Q better. Like they're, it's kind of a little more elegant and simpler in the, in the approach. So when so one of the number one feedbacks we got as we kind of started building Acorn and we showed it to people is uh it's like basically the difficulty of Q because you start getting into all of like the schema and all those other things that basically they didn't need. And so there's all this stuff in Q that we don't need that basically kind of confuses users. But then on top of it, it leads to a lot of unexpected behavior for people. Um like, so fundamentally what we got back there, it's like, there's two, there's two, uh, um, feedback we always got was one is they want an else statement, which is funny, but a Q doesn't have an else statement just as if, um, and then the second one was, uh, was that they really want to be able to override data, but fundamentally you can't override data in Q. Um, but like when you get into more complex examples where you're, um, dealing with config files, and stuff that it becomes kind of obvious that you want to be able to change keys in different in different situations or whatever. So basically, as like we went through it, like our needs, like I love Q, but like our needs of what we need for um, Acorn don't really fully align with like what Q is and where Q is going. Because um, even like those two little small things, like overriding data or the if blocks, there's reason or the else blocks. The reason why they don't exist is because of you know good reasons for Q, but like those reasons are not applicable to us. So um, it, in order to like kind of optimize the user experience for, for users, um, like this was a difficult decision, but we basically came to the conclusion that we should just kind of charge more with our own language. Um, and so far we've gotten kind of really no pushback or issue with that. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I like the release with Q. Um, it feels, yeah, it, it works well for me. In fact, I'm pretty confident I could run Q eval on that file and it probably would just work to most at least from what I can see right now. Um, but you're right about the disjunctions. Those are ones that tr still trip me up and I've been using Q a long time and I'm sure even worse for people that are new to the language because the error messages from Q can sometimes lead you down some awkward paths. Uh, very confusing. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I've written like thousands and thousands of lines. Yeah, it's like I, I've done a lot of Q and um, internally we actually still use Q um, for some um, data, like schema validation and things like that. But yeah, like the, the error messages are are kind of um, difficult and it's not just because, um, yeah, and it's kind of hard hard to solve solve those things because the, the, it's just like the fundamental nature of what they're trying to do, like unifying data or unifying the, the, the values or whatever. So, cool. but, but I very much, so it's like, it's like I very much like Q, but it just didn't work out for this use case. All right, I'm happy with that. All right, I've got a couple more questions from here and then um, we'll jump into the comments. Now, we've got these, I'm going to call them generators, but your, your secret stuff here. Um, what I'm really curious about is we've seen the token yeah. type, which generates some arbitrary string, which I think you said could be configured, um, which is really cool. Does it do X509s? Because that would be pretty awesome. Okay, so we actually had X509 built in, but. Um, we ended up deleting it because we can't, it's kind of weird. We couldn't find like a super obvious thing. So what, like, what's your use case where you want X509? Because maybe we couldn't find maybe, like, cause I built it. Cause I'm like, oh, I could totally use that. Yeah. yeah maybe it's, it's super niche, but working on mutation, mutating admission controllers where you have to have the CA and then drop the bundle into the CRD. And I know that cert manager has the key and injector and you can go down that route. Typically, I don't have cert manager in my local yeah, yeah, development yeah. clusters. So that would be my use case there. But maybe that's too niche for what this product is trying to make. Yeah. 
Well, so so I had this the same thing where it's like I've done all these things where it's like oh it'd be cool if I had um, X509. So it's like we actually built it in. You could generate um, CA certificates and then sign certificates from it and all this stuff. Um, but we ended up taking it out because it seemed like the majority of those use cases ended up being very infrastructure oriented and they weren't really needed for the application. So like the way that we're kind of taking the approach on on encryption and all that stuff is that well one like the application doesn't like. Like what I don't like, what we don't really want is like the application to like, let's say, generate a TLS certificate and use that for serving, like serving out, because like that's handled by like the ingress controller, like the ingress infrastructure, or you know something external to Kubernetes. So it's like the application doesn't really need to be aware of like encrypting its public endpoint. Um, I'm sure there's corner cases where you'll you'll say I'm wrong, but like for the general general case, it's like it doesn't seem like most of that stuff should be handled by the platform, and so like. One of the features that's coming out in the 0.2 or 0.3 release of, of Acorn is going to be like automatic TLS generation. Like we already integrate really well with Cert Manager, so if you are using Cert Manager today, like the integration is pretty straightforward. Um, but like we wanted to make it even easier for our users, where like for the default use cases, the simpler use cases, we just automatically create TLS. So so we do that on the public side. Now, if you look at the internal communication of like container to container within uh, the cluster we're leaning much more towards service mesh in that situation because it's like we've designed Acorn such that we can plug in a service mesh and then then wire up all of the service RBAC rules. And then, so it's like, basically you'll get MTLS plus service authorization, like for free, basically. You just run like the, you know, like STO Acorn plugin and we'll program all those rules. Um, so like when we look at like container to container, container communication, like I kind of also don't want containers to be doing TLS themselves because it's like, well, I can just already do that with with um, service mesh and basically do a better job. So, yeah. yeah. But if, if the use case comes back up, like if we get like um, requests for it from users or whatever, then we'll bring it back. We just, you know, <laughs> it's in Git, the Git history. We just, we kind of deleted it right now. So. All right. That's not, you're, that makes sense. Definitely. Okay. A couple more questions from me and then uh, comments. What's the difference between local data and args? Yeah, yeah. So local data. So this is like kind of like a, just a total um, uh, gratuitous use of the syntax. Um, and so uh, so basically, args is information that you pass in. So this can be passed into the user. I didn't actually show this. So like when you build the application, so like I built this application here from this, I can say um, run. And then do, 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 do. Dash, dash help. And then it creates the args on the application. So this is like, so when I deploy this application, I can pass in an argument and change it. Okay. So so the args are, are designed for like external or your input. Local data is just like just random stuff that you can just put in here. So a lot of times when we build things, um, like I'll go to a, a more more complicated example, which is the Jenkins one. Uh, let's see. So like in the local data, like here I have like the CAX, the configuration is code um, configuration in there. Um, and so I have that data in there and I can do like, you know, logic and manipulation of that. Um, but then afterwards I then basically turn that into YAML and stick it into a secret. So local data is just kind of help, help you can just put crap in there or whatever you want to kind of help with uh, your package. Okay. Uh, one last question then. Uh, can we go back to the simple acorn file? And that you list a bunch of containers. Uh, uh, yeah. We've yeah. got, you know, cache, DB. Can you run a mm -hmm. control get pods? Is that one pod with multiple containers, one pod, multiple pods? What does that translate oh, the, to in Kubernetes? Oh, no. So, like, yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, under the hood, um, let's see. So, under the hood, let's see. I'll first show you the namespaces so you understand. So, when we deploy an application, we actually, like, this, uh, how does, what's the syntax here? Uh, no, no, no. Sorry. Um, yeah, there we go. Okay. So, the, the CRD that we're actually creating under the hood is just Acorn app. Okay, so this is created in the Acorn namespace. But when we create the application, um, eh, there's too much garbage in there to, to show you. But, but basically, uh, every app 
gets deployed into its own namespace. So like you create the app, like the, the app CRD is in, is in like the user namespace. And then for each, each application, we then create a new namespace. Okay, so if I look at the namespaces, because this like this keeps the service discovery, um, keeps the service discovery very clear, uh, like very simple and portable, and it also helps with security. Um, uh, it's very easy to lock down the applications because you have one namespace per app. Um, and then we handle all the how do you cross service discovery across um, namespaces and stuff like that. that. That's like more advanced topics. But so I have this app in here, so it created this namespace. So if I look in here, you'll see I have three different pods. If I look at the deployments, you can see the deployments are like exactly, so it's like the app. So the container is actually mapped to the two pods. And so the, the reason why we called it containers is it just makes a lot more sense to users than getting into like the difficulties of pods. But you can do, if you want, you can do sidecars. Mm -hmm. um, so you can put in like sidecar foo. Um, and then, so you can still get the full power and you can also do, you can create init containers. You just say init true. Ah, um, so you can, you can, uh, you know, use the full power of pods. Um, but like we don't enter, like we don't, because like the side, like the pods and the sidecar pattern or something is super powerful, right? But it's kind of like, it's like, you don't get it until you actually need it. <laughs> so it's like, we don't shove it down people's throat of like, you need to understand a pod. It's like, no, just run containers. And then at some point they're like, oh, but I really want this container to always be next to it. And it's like, oh, that's a sidecar. You know, so anyway, so that's, that's, that's what we have. Um, so you also see like under the hood, like what it's doing of like, if I look at services, okay, so it's like, we create services of the exact same name, like uh, like this. So it's like under the hood, we're creating standard Kubernetes objects, and they're using the same names as what's in the the Acorn file. Because again, since we're using our own namespace, we can do that. It's like they're unique within the Acorn file, so they're they're also unique within the namespace. Um, so it's like most of the stuff that we're wiring up is pretty straightforward. It's like ingress services, config maps, secrets. We just deal with all the like the core types. Um, yeah, so it, it's like if you understand Kubernetes, like what this produces is pretty straightforward and, and obvious. Like it's not madness. It's not like this super heavy layer on top of Kubernetes. It's a very light layer. Um, it's just enforcing like a lot of good standards and, and stuff like that. Um, Sweet. Okay. Yeah. Let's so it's like from a security person. Sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. I was just going to say we could tackle a few of the comments that have come in from the people watching. But if you want to tackle some, if you want to mention some security stuff, please feel free. Oh, no, I was just saying from like a security perspective, like the things that we do, it's like you can't run privileged containers. By default, um, the applications have no access to Kubernetes. Um, you don't like, you know, get permissions. There is, I can show you a way to get permissions, and then it's very controlled if you want to get permissions to the, to the Kubernetes API. Um, and then on top of that, when we create, like, so I said, like, we create a new namespace for each app. So we go, and if you look at the namespace that's created, we automatically do the baseline profile for pod security. So those pods are, are, are already um, enforced that, by Kubernetes that they can't do anything. And so we're adding more things, like we're going to automatically program network policies. So you'll automatically get the network policies because the, defi the definition of how Acorn is, is like, all communication is explicit. Um, going back to the Acorn file, where was it? Like, if I don't have this port here, then nothing can talk to it. Like, we don't expose that port. But, but technically, if you know the details of Kubernetes, it is technically exposed. If you know the IP, you can hit it or whatever. But, but so the idea is like the 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 DSL describes all the communication paths and what's exposed. So then we can then go and enforce that with like network policies or Cilium or Calico or Istio, we can enforce all that stuff. Um, and we're building on kind of those integrations into the lower levels. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah, well, we can go into the questions. Yeah. Well, I think we have a question that kind of touches and kind of segues off this quite nicely. Uh, so you said that you can't have a privileged container and that's because the DSL doesn't provide any sort of interface to generate a privileged container. So what Bogdan asked very early in the session was, the issue here potentially is how the comments going to scroll off the screen. Sorry about that. But what do you do if you need to break out of the abstraction? What if I need to do something that isn't exposed by the Acorn interface? Have you got any any thoughts there? Um. Well, I mean, so there is a way to request permissions, um, and then you can do that. But like, 
the intention. Okay. So there's a bigger, <laughs> there's a bigger um, goal with Acorn in general is like, cause also it's like, we have a company and we're going to eventually try to make money and stuff like that. Oh yeah. About this, like about that. Just, I just want to make something clear. Acorn, the project is open source. It will never be like open core. We're not going to do crap like that. Like if you know our history with Rancher, um, the people at, at Acorn Labs, it's a lot of the same people. Actually, it's all the same co-founders as Rancher. Uh, we're very dedicated to open source. Okay. So you don't have to worry about that. Like, but, but it's like our fundamental premise of like what we're trying to do is like, what we see is that, um, it's effectively the operations of Kubernetes is, is too difficult. It's like, there's just, there's so much power and flexibility in Kubernetes that it leads to, um, a lot of operational complexities of everyone is kind of building, um, all of this stuff around Kubernetes to like how to deploy applications and validate it and, and do upgrades and create pipelines and all this stuff. And so our fundamental premise is basically if like if we can create a simpler application unit that is fundamentally abstracted from Kubernetes, then we can drastically reduce the operational side. And then at the end of the day, that's what big enterprises and companies care about. That's what they're going to pay money for is, is if we can reduce the operational side. So it's, it's, when you say like breaking through the abstraction, it's really important for us that the abstraction actually works for all applications. So where we draw the line is basically, if you need to do infrastructure oriented stuff, that's gonna be like more of like a, um, that's, that's gonna be like, uh, right now you can still just do everything in Kubernetes, but we will be building kind of like an Acorn system type thing where you can do extensions and drivers and stuff that will be, uh, more privilege oriented. Um, but so for the acorn file is like, we don't do any like driver infrastructure store it, you know, like we don't do that stuff. If your application needs access, like a good way to look at it is like if your application needs access to the Kubernetes API, then it's probably not just a pure application. It's probably very oriented towards Kubernetes. Um, but there is a way to request permissions. So you can request permissions and get access to the Kubernetes API. But like, once you do that, it, you have to realize you're already like kind of, you're breaking the abstraction because that thing can now do a lot of things that could be really bad. So we're trying to actually create a, a, a fairly strong abstraction layer, which I knew was extremely difficult. Um, and, and one of the, the biggest questions we always like, whenever we show Acorn to like a real diehard Kubernetes thing, the first thing Kubernetes uses, the first thing they're going to ask is what about CRDs? And so CRDs is something where it's like, well, if we allow you to just create any CRD, then it, it, it makes it such that like this unit, this, this Acorn app, app that we're deploying, it no longer has a predictable behavior because CRDs can do anything and they don't have a standard way that you interrupt interact with them. Like a very basic example is like, let's say I'm using the Kafka operator and I wanted to create a Kafka instance. If I put that CRD in my application, so when I deploy that app and then I delete that app, it's going to delete the Kafka instance, <laughs> you know, that's bad. So like we go through things where it's like, like the, the way the acorns are designed is like, if you deploy the acorn and then you delete it and then you redeploy it, um, the, the state was stored in volumes and secrets, which are not by default deleted when the app is deleted. So if you like mess up and accidentally delete it, which like happens from like GitOps, people like, oops, you know, wrong commit. And then they delete something, um, you know, we protect you from that. So it's like, you know, if you start doing all these crazy things, then it's like, you don't, you lose all the guarantees. Oh. Okay. I think in line with that, you mentioned something there and earlier, uh, you said the word driver there, but you also mentioned like, uh, Linkerd or Istio plugins earlier. So there are extension points to kind of. Yeah. Is that something that Acorn the yeah, company so, prepared? So that, Sorry. <laughs> so that's the the extension points. That's all in the works right now. So like we're designing that out and doing that of like how do we integrate all into so, um, yeah. So we're designing basically what's the plugin mechanism so that you can augment because the idea is like if you have this application definition can I create plugins that basically take that definition and then generate more resources? So this is kind of like more of the route that we're going with, um, with CRDs is like, if you need to do CRDs, like your app, um, let's say you're using a very custom ingress controller or something. Um, and so you need to be done a certain way. So, uh, we would look at like the plugin extension model, 
of like, how do we generate different resources or modify the existing resources based on your specific uh, configuration? So, so that's keeping the abstraction of like the application doesn't change, but like you have a plugin in the infrastructure layer, which can then kind of uh, modify it. And that will most likely, like we'll have a, a, an approach where you could, you know, uh, I, don't, I, I don't, I won't talk too much about it, but it, it's gonna be really cool. It's very, it should be really simple to write these extensions, but I don't wanna get too much into it. <laughs> okay, let's tackle a, a couple more questions then. So we've got one from Amir here who's asking, how do I handle scale? So I'm assuming they're looking for HPA support perhaps. Well, I mean, so the, just the basic thing is you can just put scale in here. So you can just scale, you know, say scale is uh, two. And then if you want to make it so that's changeable, then you can say, you know, scale to here and then uh, reference it like that. So then when you deploy it, you can change the scale. Um, but so so uh, HPA support is definitely coming, but it's not there yet. I mean, this project's only like about three weeks old. So yes, we will be doing HPA and auto scaling support. Like um, that's definitely on the roadmap, but just not there yet. Um, Cause that's another one where it's like, yeah, it's super hard for people to, to get auto scaling right. And so we want to make that. So it's like auto scaling, blue green deployments, kind of like canary and those type of things. Those are all definitely on the roadmap of like addressing it. Cause again, it just goes to the idea of like, like blue green or, or canary. Those are just like update models. Like fundamentally your app definition shouldn't change. Like that's more of a, how do you deploy and run it? So it's like, you don't have to build that into your, you shouldn't have to fundamentally build it into your application, how to do that. Like the, the platform and runtime should be able to take care of most of that. All right, uh, next question. What access to the cluster do I need to be able to deploy an Acorn app? Yeah, so right now you do need admin access. Um, if you don't have admin access, you can right now, it's just a shortcut is use vCluster. Um, so you can just run um, vCluster and then run, run Acorn inside of vCluster and there's no overhead or downside to that. Um, that's what like, cause I was saying, I'm looking at a way of trying to make it work for just regular users. And that's what we'll do is we'll effectively just wrap it in vCluster. But, um, but yeah, so you do need, um, you do need pr uh, uh, kind of admin access. Uh, I will show you specifically what we need, if I can figure it out. Uh, what's the, uh, sorry, this is not like my normal work, working machine. Portage. Okay, so this is specifically what, what we require. Um, which is access basically to our API groups, um, some standard core stuff, and then we need to be able to see the nodes, uh, CRDs, API, yeah. So anyways, those, those are the, the roles. So there's an actual, you know, we do set up like a proper role and role binding and all that stuff. Uh, but yeah, so you do need admin access right now. But again, if you don't have admin access and you wanna try this out, run vCluster. vCluster doesn't require admin access at all. Awesome. V cluster from loft those guys yeah okay. uh, all right next question am i limited to creating deployments as a base for the resource application i guess they're looking or talking about stateful sets uh, daemon sets etc okay so yeah so we do we do um it's so okay um we can do stateful applications but we don't use stateful sets so this is kind of a little different um and there's a lot of reasons for that. And maybe we'll find out that our reasons are bad. Um, but in our example, let me see. So docs, there's, um, let's see, how, how does one do this? I know there's like advanced topics, stateful applications. Okay, so what we do is, okay. Fundamentally, the idea of a stateful application, like what stateful sets do, is like why they're fun. Why stateful sets are fundamentally different from deployments is that a stateful set gives a gives a um, an identity, a fixed identity to each uh, container that's running, and or and that, and that identity is like persistent. So if you delete it, it will come back and it has the same identity. The identity is effectively just the DNS name. So the problem with stateful sets, in, in my mind, is that like it's kind of 
there's not just one way to run stateful applications. So sometimes stateful sets work, but sometimes like your app is still more complicated than it will work for a stateful set. So our approach to stateful applications is what we do is a little bit more manual, but it gives you a huge amount of flexibility. Cause like we've tried like running like Kafka, Cassandra, um, MySQL, Postgres, uh, Redis, um, like complicated setups, multi-master. Um, we've, we've tried running all these things in, in, uh, in Acorn and we've gotten, you know, largely to work like, you know, we've, we haven't run anything fundamental issue. Like we're not experts on all those systems. So it's not all production grade, but like, but we've been able to get them all set up and everything. And so the approach of what we do is, is kind of this trick here. It's like, you, you say, okay, if I want like two replicas, you just, this is all, again, this is like Q, Q syntax or whatever. Um, we go through, well, it's close to Q. This is not Q right here, but, um, we go through and we create a range, like you create a range of like, uh, you know, three, and then you actually create three separate, uh, like, in, like containers. So you say like container one, container two, container three, and then each one of those is going to bind a different volume. So you get volume one, volume two, volume three. So it like effectively just created a stateful set. Each one has a stable identity and it has volumes associated with it. And then there's also little tricks under the hood where it's like, if it's um, if it's an application of scale one, like if it's a container of scale one and it's using a read write only, a read write once volume, then we do like a replace strategy so you don't get two, two things trying to access the data at the same time. Um, so anyway, so our approach right now is we're not actually using stateful sets under the hood. Um, you know, again, maybe we'll find out that that was a stupid idea, but like what we found is this pattern of effectively kind of manually creating your stateful set ends up being very powerful. So again, like one of the reasons why it's so powerful is what you can do is like in this if loop here is a lot of times you have to bootstrap a system. So like the first replica, you want to run that in the bootstrap mode and the other replicas you don't want to run in like the bootstrap mode. So by basically looping through, you can say like, if I index is zero, like the first one, like if I equals zero, then add the bootstrap bootstrap arguments. So you can configure like with the logic, just doing the logic in here, you can configure the instances slightly different, um, which ends, ends up being very useful to like bootstrap clustered systems. So it's like, we've been able to bring up, yeah. So it's like things like, cause like Cassandra or Galera cluster, you know, those type of things. So I can actually show you like a more uh, realistic, what this would look like. Cause it, it starts getting, you know, like as your apps, like running the stateful thing is, is, um, complicated. It's never, it's never easy running stateful stuff. Um, so these, these examples are more complicated, but it does get into the, like Did what's capable. Not, um, so here it's like, oh yeah, sure. sure. So here, this is actually a fully working Mirai DB that does Galera cluster under the hood. So again, you can see this pattern of we're doing that. Um, but we can, we're also like, we do it. So like each, each, uh, replica depends on the previous one. So we get a nice startup, um, behavior. Um, but this handle is like also like recovery. So like, basically you can scale down to one, you can run a recovery, uh, like when you break the cluster state and stuff like that. Um, but you can see here, like the args here, um, the design and recovery and equals the bootstrap bootstrap indexes, which, which one you want to bootstrap from. Um, cause when you're doing a recovery, you might like, if, if you screwed up your whole cluster, then go, oh crap, I want to recover and then bootstrap from, um, you know, the second one, not the first one. So anyways, so, uh, but yeah, so there's all, you know, all of, all of that crap. So like, and, and this is like, I haven't talked about jobs at all, but you can do jo jobs on a schedule. So it's like, this is actually running a backup. This runs a, a backup of a Mariah DB and stores it into a, a volume. Um, but yes, there's a lot of things in here. If you look at this readme file for this, it, it goes into more details on how to uh, do all this stuff, it's like act, active active replication, um, yeah, removing replicas, whatever. Kind of all the ops stuff you would need to know. Uh, it's really cool. Like you can, it, it keeps the backups and it'll show. It, it actually has a list of the backups that are available because there's some really fancy things you can do because like, there's, um, sorry, I'll, I'll show you this. There's a really cool secret type, which is just called generated, um, which you just run a job. Let me go down here to secrets, templates. Oh crap, where is it? No, 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 I think it's in here. 
Generated. Okay, yeah. So there's a secret here, which is called backup list, which is um, generated, and it's off of the job called, uh, you know, it runs off of the, the backup job. So what happens is when this, this job runs and it does the backup, the output of this, um, this script, there's a special um, file you write to. It's like run secrets output or something like that. In that job, you write to that file, and then we pick that up and throw it into the secret. So this was like an interesting hack of like when we run the backup, um, the output of the backup uh, gets stored into this secret, and then you can just list it. So anyways, that was a fun little hack that um, Bill found, one of our engineers. Right. Awesome. Uh, anyways, yeah. So that was a very long, <laughs> long approach to all right, we don't have any mm -hmm. more questions in the comment section right now. So before we jump back just to the quick face mode, is there anything else you would like to show us that you think is really cool about ACOR? Um, well, so I, I was going to show you this, but like I think we're probably running out about time, so I don't want to go go much further. But I'll just kind of point you. So this was something um, somebody had asked me for a Jenkins uh, to do. Uh, what would it look like to run Jenkins in Acorn? And so I wanted to show this real quickly. This is like, you can run this um, Acorn. So basically build it, run this, and then you just say expose the admin user and that will give you the password. Um, but in here, like this is super uh, cool. This is running J Jenkins and it's using the um, configuration as code approach, which integrates with Kubernetes. And it's also using the Kubernetes um, cloud plugin. Um, so it's pretty, most of the stuff seems pretty straightforward, like set up a bunch of directories. These are ephemeral. These are coming from secrets. This is the file. And then a bunch of probes um, of oh, the formatting. This is terrible. Um, but uh, so I just want to show you, this. this is where you can actually request permissions. So this is like a short syntax which just says, like, basically, give me read, write access to pods. Um, this is read only to pods log. This is like the more verbose syntax, which will give you, you know, you can ask, ask for anything you want. So you can um, get privileges, um, and so that this uses it because this internally is using the Kubernetes cloud thing. So like when you run this, it's really cool uh, little Acorn because like when you run it, it comes up and it's already wired up to Kubernetes. So if you set up a job, it's going to launch a pod in Kubernetes and you know start running the the Jenkins uh, jobs or whatever. But I just wanted to show you like the way that's controlled, like kind of the security because like when you ask for permissions, as I was mentioning before, like that is kind of breaking the abstraction. Um, so it's very explicit of, um, let's see, if, oh, this might take a little bit. Huh. Okay, let me see how long it'll take to build this. Um, because this is this uh, internally is actually doing, a, it has a custom, a custom image for the builder because I was trying to get it to work for my own thing. So the, the image has like go in it or something. So it has to do that. I don't think it should be that, that take that long. Let's start. let's see. Um, but I just because I just wanted to show you the experience. Like when you go to run it, it's going to it's very explicit of like this thing is asking for permissions. Um, so you can't run something um, without basically saying saying if it asks for permissions, you have to explicitly agree to letting it have permissions. And then on top of that, you can't give permissions you don't have. Like just regular Kubernetes escalation checks, like that type of stuff. It'll, it'll do that. Okay. Uh, let's see. Wow. GCC. Oh, because I installed Golang. Yeah. I'm just like, what in the world? I thought I just, well, I was just installing curl. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> need a compiler for curl? So do you see a future here where we're like, like acorns are going to be published to like the artifact hub and people can just say, I want to deploy Jenkins or Postgres and the acorns are publicly available and easily consumed? Yeah, yeah. And that's what we'd like to get to because it's like Docker, you know, Docker did a decent job of like, you know, creating shareable Docker images. Um, but honestly, like the Helm chart ecosystem of running apps, I mean, if anybody's like realistically used a lot of the Helm charts out there, you'll know that like um, they basically will never run the first try. And, you know, it takes quite a bit to finally get the arguments right and eventually figure out. And then it's like a lot of reading and knowing what the best, to, you know, so it's like, I don't think the ecosystem is very good in terms of like, uh, you know, these applications and stuff like that. What, what you see right now is like, um, uh, if you look at like, let's say like operator hub, 
what's available for operator. The majority of the things are all like Kubernetes infrastructure oriented, you know, so like security scanners or um, operators that, you know, so it's like, it's not really application, you know, so it's like, I don't know. I'm, I'm like, and I'm in general, like not a big fan of operators. I don't think that's like a very good pattern. Like, I'm not saying don't use operators because it's kind of like the best thing that exists right now. Um, but uh, I hope to see that we can basically um, create a stronger ecosystem around Acorns than what Helm or operators has done. Okay, so finally that took forever. So when you go to run this, this is what it's going to do. It's going gonna, it's gonna to warn you. And so like, this is very dangerous, but it's saying like, okay, this app is requesting these scope, like these, these permissions. Um, uh, and then you have to agree to it. But so if I agree to it, then this is basically, um, this is going to bring up my, my uh, uh, this will bring up Jenkins. Uh, anyways, cool. yeah. So that was probably like the last thing I wanted to show. Awesome. I'm going to pop this back over then uh, here. Okay. So that was really cool. Um, if anyone has any more questions before we finish up, now is your time to drop them in the comment section. That in, I'll, I'll kind of give you one more for myself. But you said this project is really young, it's really early, things are moving fast. Like, what's coming up? What's on the roadmap for the next kind of couple of months? Um, so just a uh, minor. So like, we're adding just like a bunch of like little minor things. Like, uh, of so TLS support is coming. Um, so that like out of the box, we'll just automatically wire up TLS again. Cert Manager already works, but so that's coming. Um, you know, being able to label and annotate everything because people want to be able to put, you know, different annotations that do weird things under the hood in Kubernetes. So um, we're adding support to basically label and annotate everything. Um, you know, the the language, as I said, is like it's it's Q right now, but we're trying to form like it, it's a sub, it's a kind of like a fork of Q right now, but we're trying to formalize that into our into our own thing so it becomes very clear the scope of what we're using and everything. Um, but the bigger stuff that's coming is, uh, and you know, let's see where are we we're in, we're almost in September, right? Like the end of August, yeah. So like, of course we're like conference driven, so conference driven development. So we're shooting for like KubeCon time. Um, we'll have a much bigger features in the realm of kind of like CI/CD and stuff. So. Basically, once you have the Acorn, how do you very quickly wire up the pipeline? Right now, it already works very well. Like, I didn't show this, but when you do Acorn run, you can do dash O YAML, and it will just basically spit out the CRD, and you can put that into your GitOps flow. So it's like, if you're already doing GitOps today, Acorn integrates super well into, into any GitOps flow. Um, but, like, we kind of believe the, the entire, everything could be significantly easier. So how do you do like automated builds and deployments and and um, CI like um, like one of the one things that we've we've already talked about this one this feature is like the idea of running like Acorn test. So the idea of Acorn test is like um, within a CI flow you want to test your application. So it's like with Acorn it's very easy to just spin up your application. Um, you know, you just do Acorn run and you can run it anywhere. It's kind of self-contained or whatever. You can very easily spin it up. So we want to add basically a test mode where we spin up the application, but then you define a series of jobs, um, you know, and you can basically, when you, you say test foo, it will run the test job, which can then do like an integration test suite or, or, or whatever. And so you can very easily test your application within like a CI flow, um, you know, to, to do like integration tests really easily. Awesome. No. So that's some of the stuff coming. Well, it sounds exciting. And I, I've been called out by Russell in the chat who asked the question five minutes in, so 18 minutes ago, and I didn't throw it to you. So I'm going to do that now. But uh, Russell wants to know what's actually in the OCI image slash artifact. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Um, OK, so I can describe it. So because um, we get this, the question comes up a lot, too, because they're like, oh, are you copying all the image? Like, OK, so. When we built the when we build the Acorn image, um, the top level like I'll get into like the OCI details or whatever because like OCI has um, basically manifest and lists or index. I think it's called an index. So an index is a thing that just points to a bunch of other things, and then um, the manifest um, describes basically like a like a, a container, a Docker image and that has layer refers to layers. Okay, so um, when we build the Acorn image, we create one layer which has the Acorn metadata in it. 
And then we create a list which links to the metadata and then to all the existing Docker images by digest. And so if we built an image, like we'll build that, push that, and then link it. If it's an image you just referenced in your ACOM file, we just reference the, the same, like the exact same one. So we don't duplicate any content. It's not a new structure. So if you have an existing Docker image, like the digest that's there, we use that digest directly. Um, the only thing is that like uh, the manifest list, if you're doing multi-arc, will we'll change because like we dereference to find the architectures. But anyway, so like the, the layers and the content, like those digests don't change. Um, there will, when you use Acorn, you will see if you uh, push somewhere, like if you didn't, like let's say you just built an Acorn image and it just has the metadata and it's referencing existing Docker images. If you push it somewhere, you'll see it's pushing tons of content. That has to do with like more of like a bug right now in the implementation because the content already exists in the in the um, registry, but it doesn't necessarily exist in your repo. So we're doing a push, a pushing content that we don't need to push. Um, it, this, it, like there's a, a, a feature in, in the API called mounting and we're not doing that properly in some certain areas. So it looks like you're pushing a bunch of content, but it's like basically you push like all the content and then the registry throws it away because it, it already exists there. Anyways. All right. Uh, okay, so Bogdan followed up with a question, which I think you've just answered, which is that do the images remain the same? Oh, yeah. But then I think he says that you've answered that, and then he says... And then there's a question about how does it handle... <laughs> so for the inter-registry images, okay, so this is really important, is that, like, so what we're doing is, like, is if you're... Pull, if you're when we push the acorn, all the content for that acorn and all the reference Docker images go to that target one. So if you've pulled from like five different registries, it's going to pull all that content and push it into your one registry. That is very much done by design. Cause like the idea is once you have your acorn, it's fully encapsulated. So if anyone's done air gap setups, you'll, you'll understand the pain of this. Like when you do, let's say you deploy a helm chart and you try to do an elm in a air gap that helm chart references three docker images you have to configure each one of those docker images of like well what's the repo to pull from you know where to get that you like you have to find all that content and, and mirror it offline um so this basically it just turns your app into one artifact and so it's like you can just basically do acorn pull and then a acorn push to a different registry and then that's it or you, you don't have to use acorn you can use like a tool like scopio or crane to do some of that stuff. Don't use Docker because Docker mutates stuff as you push and pull. Uh, but if you use a tool like Scopio or Crane, you can just move things around. Awesome. Well, we've gone a little bit over time, but we have no more questions. I just want to say thank you for joining us today, for sharing all of your knowledge and the history behind Acorn and for walking us through a couple of different demos and how it works. I hope people are excited to check it out. And uh, definitely reach out to Darm if your feedback. I'm sure he'd love to. Love to have it. Yeah, yeah. And so I'm on I'm on Twitter. I build the cloud on Twitter. Um pretty active there. If you have anything, just ping me there. That's that's like the main thing that I usually <laughs> check is Twitter. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you again for your time. Have a, a wonderful day and I'll speak to you again soon. Have a good day. All right. Thanks. Watching Warcode Live.